All right, folks, you're live with Lonzo, the Godfather of West Coast Hip Hop. And we have another legendary behind the scenes player from the uh, West Coast Legends of Hip Hop, man, or hip hop and more, I should say. You've seen him on my show before, you've seen him on my podcast, you've seen him in my master class, and he's back again with some more energy, some more stories. Another triple OG like me, my man, the engineer, Supreme, Mr. Mike Frankie. What's up with you, baby? Good to see you, baby. Good to see you. Thank you. First and foremost, let me say how humbled I am to be here. Thank you. I'm glad to have you back, Doc. I mean, every time we get to kicking it, Doc, it's like two old, two kids. And we don't see. We so old. We understand each other. Okay. We can talk <laughs> really the same don't. language because we've been around the same length of time, pretty really much. Don't. Dealing and, with the same, same kind of situation, same people. Exactly. So when we kick it, this is a whole other energy. And man, uh, last week you were the guest on my music masterclass. And you said something that I, I wasn't aware of. Maybe I was aware of, but I forgot that you were the engineer, one of the driving forces behind the uh, the um, uh, album "Banging on Wax." And you said some things in the, yeah. in the uh, masterclass that was so prolific. I had to bring you back on the show today. Just talk about some of the things that you experienced putting that album together, man. Okay. Um, first of all, the person who was paying for the record was named Ronnie, um, Ronnie Phillips, and Ronnie had a best friend, a really close friend, named Tweety Bird Loco. Okay. Tweety Bird Loco was from Kelly Park in Compton. Okay. He was neighbors with Dre and Easy and them cats. And Ronnie was doing a record on a kid named D. And D was a Muslim. Mm. And, and, and Ronnie wanted to do gangster type music. And D was with it. But when, Ron, when Ronnie started doing putting naked white women in the yeah, videos yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. D wasn't feeling that, D shook the spot. So Ronnie turned to Tweety Bird. He said, Tweety Bird, you should rap, right? Tweety okay. Bird wasn't, Tweety Bird never would tell you he was a rapper. Okay. But he ended up making a record called One of, he, he was doing some, some LL Cool J type rhymes. And Ronnie was like, nigga, fuck that sitting on the bus stop sucking on a lollipop shit. Uh, <laughs> well, let's do some gangster shit. <laughs> sitting on the bus stop waiting for a body to drop. Let's do some shit like that. And okay. Tweety Bird took that and ran with it and he made 187 Drive By. Okay. Right? Which okay. is a pretty legendary record when you look at, uh, uh, I read an interview with Scarface and Scarface said that was his favorite record. Wow. Right? So that being said, Tweet comes up with the idea, man, let's do a banging on wax record. Right? Okay. Let's do that. And Ronnie was like, you know what? That ain't a bad idea. Mm. Right, so the whole concept came from Tweety's, Tweety's, Tweety's brain, and he was actually the catalyst for bringing a lot of the hoods there. Okay, Tweet was Tweet okay. was the man. Okay, whether whether he got pre property credit or not, it's not the issue. I'm telling you, it was all came out of Tweet's brain. Okay, because I was working with Ronnie before everybody. Okay, right. What were you doing with Ronnie back then? Engineer. Okay, right. Um, working with him actually. Um, so. We get to, we do this record at Leon Hayward's joint on Crenshaw and Rodeo, which was called, actually people called it Eve Jim because that was the name of Leon's label, but the actual name of the recording school, the recording studio was um, Sunnyside. Sunnyside, okay. Right, it is now a Korean hair store. All right. Sadly speaking. Um, so, motherfucker. anyway, go ahead. The first day of the session, I'm there, like, I'm because I'm the engineer, I'm always there first. I'm there and a gang of bloods come in there, like a gang of rear rags. It was a stretch from Bounty Hunters, Big Y from Inglewood, uh, uh, from family, Christian Mafia niggas, um, the homies from uh, the South Siders from Compton. Um, it was just a gang of cats from Castle Pyru with no Crips. Okay. No Crips. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the first cat that was representing the crib side that came in the door was Domino. Okay. Right. But you got to understand, some of these cats weren't really active gang members. What you mean? Most of them were. Okay. Right. Okay. But it was a couple of cats that Ronnie chose just because they had good rhyming skills. Okay. Right. And they became guilty by association, for lack of a better word. Okay. Right. Uh, my girl, Nene. Uh, what was Nene's name? Nene X. Nene X. But she was Bloody Mary mm. on this album, right? On the album that we're referring to. Okay. She wasn't an active gang member. She ended up being one though. Wow. Right? From the experience, she ended up, she, you know, she chose a side, 
right? Okay. Um, so it was a lot of people, it was a lot of people that were really active gang members and it was a couple that weren't, right? Uh, when David, I think, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong with this, but I'm, I'm thinking Tweedy called Cluso and Cluso bought Battlecat mm. to the table. Uh, I, but, but like that was 92, man. That was a lot of weed and a lot of beer, <laughs> for, for that, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so how was the vibe, man? The vibe was really cool. It was some tension at first, okay. right? But everybody knew what the agenda was. Okay. And everybody acted cool. There were no altercations on that first record that I know of because I left the record kind of early. Um, there was a, a situation, it got kind of tense. Like one time, the one thing about that record what was really great was that it was some classic bagging session. Okay. Like it was <laughs> jokes, 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 right? And sometimes them jokes hit home, you know? And, and uh, I told uh, Stretch from Bounty Hunter, uh, I told Stretch, we, we got to one of them little bagging sessions. I said, nigga, you can't rap gifts, nigga. <laughs> and he got hot, right? And he pulled a pistol on me. What? Yeah, the pistol was about this big. Okay. But it had a clip. Like <laughs> <laughs> he said, nigga, you better be glad I'm trying to rap, nigga, because I'm a real gangster, nigga, and I'll kick your door in and woo 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 woo. And I looked at that nigga. I said, man, I can't even get you to give me a ride home because you asked me where I live. I told you where I live. You said, shit, I ain't going over there. So miss me. We just put the pistol away and shit, right? That nigga owe me a hundred dollars too. Stretch. I need that hundred bucks. Um, I, I hit him for a hundred bucks in crap game. Oh, no shit. But it was Ronnie's money. Okay. And Jay Shanklin interceded, one of the producers. So it was okay. when the record first started, the producing staff basically was Cat, Jay Shanklin, Geek and Noise from Fly Deuce, from Fly Deuce Villain, um, Cluso, um, Box. Um, this is all very long ago, though, man. Y'all got to work with me. Um, one thing that, I, that, that, that struck me about this particular situation was I remember when we first fired up the mic and it was Stretch and Little Joe from, from Compton, from South, I think it was from Southside, okay. right, from, from, from over there. And they went to banging and I stopped the tape, Joe. So I stopped the tape and I looked at Ronnie and I said, Ronnie, do we really want this, man? I said, we should do this. We should approach this a little differently. Hmm. Right. As opposed to them banging on each other like that, we should be talking about why this happened and what we can do to prevent it from occurring again. But it went straight head to head violence. And I knew then that shit was headed for a fucking disaster. Hmm. Right. And I carry a burden of guilt for this record. Me and OG Sinlok was talking about this too, because Sin was there. Sin was one of the first Chris to walk in the door. And uh, with the Freddy Krueger mask and shit, and that nigga scared the shit out of me. And I'm from the streets. I was like, I don't want to fuck with that nigga right there, right? So, but me and Sam was just talking about this, and uh, we carry a burden of guilt for that record, dude. What do you mean, burden of guilt? Well, before we did that record, there were no Bloods in Tennessee, or no Crips in Philly. There was no Bloods in New York, no Crips in Detroit. That didn't exist. Mm. When we did that record, that record was so hot, it took gangbanging global. Mm. Right. We started getting red, we started getting fan mail from Brussels, from from European dudes, white cats. Like, I'm down with the Crips. I'm down with the Bloods. It was that influential. They did the Mari show, right? Oh no shit. Yes, yes. Um, I was supposed to go, but I didn't really. I, I had mixed emotions about being a part of that record. And once I did that record, by the way, it cost me a lot of high profile clients. No shit. Yes, it did. Like who? Um, I hate to mention names, but. You know, I was working with some pretty influential people. Why do you think they stopped messing with you? Because I, I was affiliated with niggas that was robbers and gangbangers. Mm. Now, you know, they assume, but always been these niggas that they were scared of, but I just never was like that with okay. them. And when I did that record, I stopped getting them calls. No shit. No shit. Did it ever, did it ever come back around or did it just- Yeah, it came back around to me. Like, I was like, I, I ran into someone at an event and I was like, yo, you just cut me off, nigga. What's happening? He said, man, you know, you kind of spooked us with that banging shit. Mm. You know, and I was like, I got it. You know? Wow, that, that's amazing, man, that they would trip like that. But all of a sudden, nowadays, it's 
damn near fashionable. Exactly. It's become a, it's become a fashionable culture. But see, everybody want to be a gangster until it's time to do some gangster shit. Yeah, that's true too. And you know that. You know, I laugh at cats all the time, man. Look, you had NWA in your in your living room. I said, if I had a problem, I wouldn't call that. Not one of them time. <laughs> I wouldn't call none of them, bruh. Okay, I understood what I was working with. Okay, what it was. I, right. I experienced that gang that, that gang uh, interaction back in Centennial, and it, was, it got real serious over some stupid shit. I, I got involved. I had two situations that that changed my life because I realized the shit that we fighting for. It ain't worth dying or going to jail for. Okay, I'm not your dog. Wait, wait. One of, one of my situations was my partner's dog beat up a gangbanger's dog, and, and a dog fight. A dog fight. An actual two dog dogs fight. fighting. Two dogs fighting. The gangbanger's dog got beat up by my partner's dog because my partner didn't go to the same high school as I did. It was they, a they knew we was partners. They was gonna jump on me. I went, they ain't my goddamn dog. Why am I in this shit, okay? Why am I in this? This ain't my dog, okay? Well, you was homeboy, and if you was homeboy, you, huh? <laughs> so I ended up, I ended up my, now my homeboy being the kind of dude he was, he ended up going around the corner, and he handled, he, he got into, he handled the dude, the dog gangbang. He actually won the fight, which actually made it worse. Exactly. Because now you can't let you no civilians you, you, beat no gangbanger up. Yeah, you got you got niggas on your bumper now. They on now the bumper we bumper. I can't go to the grocery store, man. I can't go to the this is go. see you gotta understand what, what people don't understand is we are old enough to watch. We saw it begin. Right. We right. saw it start. Right. And we saw where it was going. Ooh, you that, know. Ooh, I remember that, when I was a kid, I, I was a dancer. That's how I actually got exposed to the business. And I was at a dance at the, which, which is now the Hilton on Century, but back then it was the LA International Hotel, yeah. right? Yeah. I was at a dance and uh, I went in the bathroom and it was a brother about six, eight, and he had a gash in his head that went from the back of his head to the front about this wide. And he was looking in the mirror and he said, cuz, don't go in the dark, <laughs> right? Don't get caught in the dark. And I walked out of the bathroom and took it. And Barefoot Pookie was out there terrorizing the crowd, right? And niggas had pistols and, you know, and sawed off shotguns and shit. You know, them niggas used to take, a leather coat was a thing back Come in the man. day. You had Come a leather on. coat on, you know, you was a target. Dude, I got my coat taken. <laughs> I, but, I, but I got it back though, Mike. <laughs> you got it back. But understand this, the, the cat that jacked me for my coat, wasn't even my coat. I figured, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I figured my partner, he went to Gompers, okay? He went to Gompers. They were taking jackets over there for real. Yeah. He yeah. had to try and walk home down Hoover with that jacket on. They weren't going to make it. No, it wasn't. But I live right down the street, right, right, right down the hill from my school. And I figured if a cat tried to get me, I could make it home. Right. So I wore his school, his, his coat to school with the intentions on buying it, okay? I'm sitting up there. I'm talking to this girl, like, trying to be cool and shit. And a cat caught me, man, put me in uh, 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 a choke off. Cho <laughs> I'm unbuttoning this son of a bitch, right? I, buttoned, I was buttoning and begging, man, because I ain't, I ain't finishing my coat. I can't pay for it. I ain't got no money, blah, blah, blah. Huh? Oh, no. And, uh, man, I'm sitting there. I'm trying to get this cat off my ass. And I pulled, the, finally got the coat off and was about to give it to him. And my partner from my, my neighborhood saw me doing, what's going on? I told him what was happening to me, put your coat back on. And he stopped, he actually stopped homeboy from taking my coat. Your joke, your joke. And dude that was about to get the coat, they was about to fight over me not giving him the coat. I said, no, man, he ain't in this. That's the difference back then. Right. I was a civilian. Right. No, man, leave, leave him alone. That's my homeboy. Plus, right. his mama, I tell us all the time, his mama, his grandmama, and my mama went fishing every day to get there was no way in the world he could let me get my, my coat right, taken. And, go home and, he was, and he was and he was he was a shot caller at school. Right. He, it wasn't gonna happen. So he had to protect me. Plus we was cool. Right, right. But he had to look out for me and he wouldn't let he wouldn't let us the the other cat take my coat, but I never wore a leather jacket to school again. Man, this is what's so cold, dude. I when I went to well after we did that record, because it was one of the hottest records that year, there was a show called The Box. You remember, I remember the, box, the Box, yeah. Right. And that year. That was the number one requested record on the box. Okay. Right. And I went to Tennessee to make some records with some cats. And when I went to Tennessee, they was banging. Mm. Right. And I had a cat run up on me and he was like, yeah, I'm from Pyro. I said, no, you're not, bro. 
I said, you're not from Pryor. You're from Knoxville, Tennessee. You know, do you know Pryor is a street? He didn't even know Pryor was a fucking street. He, I was in Detroit. Nigga banged Hoover on me. He didn't even know Hoover was a street. Wow. Right? So that's how influential that record was. Right? I went to, I went to a store. in a, What town was I in? In Louisiana. I go to use a public telephone booth, and a nigga had Pyru Love written on the phone booth. Mm. So that lets you know, I'm talking about, a, I'm in a hillbilly town. Right, right. Right? So that's how far reaching the tentacles of that record was. And I call them tentacles before, because of reason. When we did the Gangster Compilation album, mm -hmm. right, there were 64 people on, the, on that cover of that record. Okay. Right? Half of them were dead. Mm. By the time we did the compilation, they, they were gone. And the other half were incarcerated with 25 years of death. That's deep. Right. We lost the cat four clips. Um, four clips used to catch, used to take his bike, ride his bike from Compton, right? Catch a train, catch the bus or whatever, right? And come to the studio and they killed him. And he was a non-affiliate, mm. right? He was making a gang mending record mm. in the process of making one of those. Each one, reach one, teach one, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, so ironically, I take part in the first record and I was doing the very last record that was going to be in a Bang & Wax series because Ronnie died in the process of making it. So nobody, everybody in that situation got messed up. Fucked over. Fucked over. It was right? no winners in that Nini, situation. Nini X ended up getting killed in, on a motorcycle, in a motorcycle mm. accident. I don't think Danny Girl was an active gang member, but she was the girl that represented the side of the book. Okay. Right? Um, but maybe she was. I don't know. I didn't try to know these motherfuckers like that because I got my own issues. Right. right? right, right. <laughs> these niggas is gangbangers, all right? <laughs> now, we had, I've been through that as a kid. You remember Rough, Tough, and Dangerous? Yeah. You remember uh, RTD, RTD, the bus yeah. line? Yeah. Man, I used to see niggas get mocked on the bus. Check this out. Remember Festival in Black? At MacArthur Park? Yeah. I got a wild story for you. I'm a Go kid though, right? I'm like 13 or some shit. And uh, we sitting on the on the embankment by 6th Street and we rolling some weed and shit and a brother come up and ask us for a cigarette. And I'm standing up, my two partners is sitting down, but when we left the east side, they got on ace deuces, right? And they not gang members. Okay. But once again, this shit is not fashion. They got on ace deuces, blue leather jackets, you know what I'm saying? They mm. look like Crips, right? We get to MacArthur Park, we roll on the weed. I'm standing up smoking a cigarette and they sitting down on the hill. The weed is right here, right? Um, cat came up, he said, let me get a cigarette, man. I said, no problem. I slide him a cigarette, he hit it. He said, you know what? You motherfuckers look like Crips, right? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm a fucking kid, right? <laughs> and I look up and we surrounded. Right? And it's just them niggas from Denver Lights. Hmm. Right? Real rag rag niggas, right? And uh, they snatched the, the beanies and ace deuces off these niggas' heads and threw them on the ground. It was like, what you want to do about it? And he looking at me. I was just standing there like this, like, say, I'm not dressed like that. So you ain't got no problem with me. And the nigga looked at me and said, you could have got fucked up with your hands in your pocket too, nigga. I'm the nigga that just gave you a cigarette pocket. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? So the bottom line is they left us alone. Right, they gave us a pass. Right. Now I'm mad. Right, I'm mad at these, I'm mad at these niggas because I told them niggas don't dress like that before we leave the house. Okay. Right. Now we on the bus going home. It's Crips on the bus from the front <laughs> to the motherfucking back. Right. Okay. <laughs> and every nigga that get off the bus getting socked out. Mm. You know when you go to the back door to get oh they they beating the dog shit out of nigga. I, I would have rolled that motherfucker to cop it. I wasn't getting <laughs> off that motherfucker right because it was a gang of them niggas. And once again, them leather coats. Right. It was so many niggas on the bus that I had to sit here and one nigga, the, two, the, we, had to, we were separated. And the nigga leaned over to me so, and he looked at me and said, that's your partner. I said, yeah, man, we all together. He said, uh, you sure is wearing a nice jacket? I knew then what that business was. He said, I think I'm gonna have that before I get off the bus. And I looked at him and I didn't know what the fuck to say. You know, it wasn't my motherfucking jacket. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I told that nigga to wear that bullshit, right? So we had a blood issue at the park and a crip issue on the way to the house. God damn, now check bad this. Day. Now check this. When we get to 7th and Broadway, the police mobbed the bus, mm. right? 
She took everybody under, took everybody off the bus that looked like a crib. Nigga, I'm looking out the window. Right? I'm looking out the window. Right? They didn't take me off the bus. They didn't take my boys off the bus. On the 95 on the Vernon bus, this this crib, this gang banging shit was out of control. It was two cats coming from LA High. They wasn't gangbangers. One nigga was in ROTC, right? And the other nigga was just- Harmless, by the way. Yeah, he was harmless, right? And the other nigga was harmless too, but he was hanging out the window, hollering, blood, Pedro Bishop, all that kind of goofy shit. He was playing, but he didn't know what he was doing. When the bus got on Hooper, some niggas pulled up in a 64 Chevy and they heard the nigga hollering out, because he was only hollering when the bus would pull away, right? right. They heard him. The motherfucker had a, you know, had hydraulics. So when the, 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 the Chevy pulled in front of the bus and just laid down in front of the bus, the driver was stuck, right? Three or four niggas got out the Chevy and came on the bus, mm. right? Just like, just like a jet out of Compton. Straight out, just came right on the bus, so on my mama, came straight on the bus. And was like, where the Pablo Bishop at? And the nigga who was doing all the hollering moved. He moved seats, right? Only the ROTC nigga was sitting there, right? <laughs> and the nigga said, you the pe and slapped him. You, and slapped him like three times in a row and he had a sister on the bus and the sister jumped up and said, don't let him hit you like that, Stanley. And that nigga's homie fired on her and knocked her out, right? Okay. I'm, I'm sitting there like, wow, this is really fucking happening, right? I was a fucking kid. I ended up going to LA High, getting kicked out of Jeff, going to LA High, and some niggas surrounded me because I was on the east side. Mm. I wasn't even gang affiliated at that point. Right, right. Right? I caught them niggas. I went home the next day. Because when I, I never checked in the class at LA High. They, I was, teachers thought I was in the girls' classes that I was fucking with. You know, okay. I, go, I just go to their classes, right? And uh, <laughs> it's just some funny shit. So the girls was telling me, them niggas from schoolyard, they, they own your bumper, right? And I'm like, Okay, I got some of them. I go home, get a pistol. When I come back, they try to surround me in the little lunch area. I draw down, they break, right? The next day, they called the police on me. Mm. I got expelled from all LA City schools wow. for that fucking pistol. And then I got a gang affiliation on my jacket, on my juvenile jacket, because it was a gang incident, mm. right? So a nigga ended up banging by proximity. <laughs> like, oh, you by from proxy. Avalon? Yeah, you, where you from? 47 now, oh, you was a crib. You from Fire Trade. You were this, you were that. You mm. feel me? I went out and then see, here's the thing. Before crack cocaine came into the game, it wasn't as violent. Right. But once drugs, once crack cocaine got into the game, it became a whole nother issue. First, see, first it was just territorial and ego. Then it became about money. Then it became about money. That's when it got crazy. That's when it got motherfucking That's when crazy. it got crazy. That's when okay. it got crazy. And that record, was a microcosm. It was a it was a, a a very tiny look into what was happening in what was happening in Los Angeles at that time with gang culture. You remember Watch Stacks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was there, baby. Both I, of them. Yeah, now, 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 hold on. Tookie and Jamil turned that son of a turned that motherfucker out. Okay. I remember tell, that big ass scene they formed on well, the field? But see, I tell people that I, it, I tell people that they tell me I'm lying. What, it, it might not. I, I remember what, ha what happened. How that happened was Jesse J Jesse Jackson. Yeah, Jesse Jackson. Um, coalition, the Rainbow uh, Coalition. Every time they had a deal with the Raiders, I think the Raiders was playing at. The, in the no, that was way Rams, before that. That was the, the, the Rams. Rams. The Rams was playing. This was a Saturday afternoon. Rams were playing Sunday, and the deal was you could have the concert, but nobody could dance on the field. Well, as soon as the music played. Everybody rushed when down. When Rufus to the Thomas field. got on, a, on a, when Rufus Thomas hit the stage, yeah, everybody they robbed it. it. Okay, now Jesse Jackson tell tell the tell the, the Crips come down and form a human chain around the track. Okay, and they took over the whole yeah. field. Took the whole field. It was so many yeah. of them cats, dude. I remember niggas that weren't even Crips joined the Crips that day. When I was sitting, when I was sitting, where I was sitting, I was sitting like. I can look on the side of the stage, right? I didn't have a front view, I had a side view. And all when they when they marched in, right? When they marched in, they started going because they went, they ended up eventually all up ended up at the top, remember? Okay, right. When they when they was coming up in double file, going to the top of the stadium or whatever the fuck that is, right? Right. Whoever was coming down got bobbed. Man, they threw one dude down. Man, that's amazing. But we didn't have the technology that we have now to record incidents. 
but I witnessed, we have witnessed so many incidents at high school dances, so many incidents at clubs, so many incidents where it just jump off. You know right now it's happening like a motherfucker. I you saw know? a cat at the, at, the, at the Watt Stacks. It was so bad at the Watt Stacks. They was, it was a mob of cats. Guys was actually just volunteering to Crips for the Crips that day just not to get jumped on. They wanted to be on the winning side because the Crips had the LAPD out number. LAPD put their hands up and just quit. Yeah, the hand, okay. LAPD backed away they just, from it. They, 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 was like, they we, went we, set up behind uh, by the scoreboard and just kicked it. And you know what? You know what their attitude was? What? Let's let these niggas kill themselves. 